Um, my clock has just struck noon here in Chicago, so we are going to get started. Welcome all from across the country and indeed the world based on your chats to a conversation about literature and the financial crisis of 2008 with Kenneth W. Warren. Uh, and I am just going to give you the briefest of introductions to the Graham School uh, before we jump right into this conversation. I'm Seth Green, and on an afternoon like this one, I'm especially proud to say that I am the Dean of the Graham School here at the University of Chicago. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with Graham, we are part of the university's original plan when it was founded to revolutionize university study in this country. The vision founded by William Rainey Harper was to take the cutting edge of this university and extend it. And thus we became the first lifelong liberal arts extension in the United States to take the incredible assets of a university like ours and make sure that they reach all. For more than 130 years, we have been trailblazing lifelong learning by finding new ways to bring it to people across the country and indeed the world. Uh, we joke that we began the distance learning movement in 1895, uh, because that was the year that we set up the first correspondence classes in the United States, where in this case, farmers who needed to be back with their crops could actually mail in uh, their responses and get credit so that they could continue their education even when they could not be on campus. Uh, today, we have four programs that define our offerings as a school. We have one of the most rigorous and respected Master of Liberal Arts in the world. We have a basic program where for 76 years now, individuals have gone deep into core texts of the Western canon. We have open enrollment, and today we're going to be talking with one of the extraordinary faculty members at the university who is generous enough to teach in our open enrollment courses and to then be available to all of you as lifelong learners. Uh, there are courses across different disciplines. Today, we'll obviously be looking into literature and the financial crisis as an example. And then we have annual programs, everything from the future of museum publishing all the way over to how to better know your Chicago. Uh, there are four assets that we say make the Graham School so special. Uh, the first is the most obvious. We are part of the University of Chicago, and this is just an extraordinary ecosystem of big ideas that challenge and change the world that we have the honor of being a gateway to for lifelong learners. The second is that we try to integrate a liberal arts core into everything that we do. And so we try to think about ideas, not just in the moment, but also in the context of time and space. We have, as you're going to see today, world-class faculty and instructors who elect to teach with us. And then what most distinguishes us is that we have ambitious learners, all of you. Uh, there is a joke that one of our team members uses that we put the adult in adult learning. And literally what that looks like is classes that I've been visiting where everyone has actually done the reading multiple times. And everyone in the context of a half hour will actually speak and share a perspective. And I know one of the reasons we are able to attract such extraordinary faculty and instructors is that they get so much out of being in the classroom with all of you. Uh, so with that, let me just mention that there are other upcoming opportunities for you to glimpse into our work, and you can see them here. Uh, but I am so grateful to be now able to introduce Professor Kenneth W. Warren. Uh, Professor Warren's scholarship and teaching focus on American and African American literature from the late 19th century through the middle of the 20th century. He is particularly interested in the way that debates about literary form and genre articulate with discussions of political and social change. His single authored books, which include What Was American, African American Literature, So Black and Blue, Ralph Ellison and the Occasion of Criticism, and Black and White Strangers, Race and American Literary Realism, explore how American literature by Black and White authors helped consolidate and subsequently respond to Jim Crow America, a topic that has always been important, but that in many ways we are finally as a country uh, coming to better appreciate uh, in our current reckoning. And um, I know that as many people have gone through that, they have turned to Dr. Warren's literature and writing. Uh, I want to now just mention that this today is going to be a preview of Dr. Warren's upcoming course uh, that is on this topic of the financial crisis shaping 
more recent literary fiction. Uh, and the course is going to be examining writers from the United States, the United Kingdom, and across Asia, and will try to understand the challenges and meaning of this crisis to novelists. And so having shared all of that, let me stop sharing my screen so that you can see uh, the person that we have the honor of speaking with this afternoon. Uh, and Dr. Warren, just to get started, um, I'd love to begin by examining at a high level the connection between the financial crisis and literature, because I think it's such an interesting focus for a course. And I am curious how you came to this topic and why you believe that the financial crisis would have consequences for literature. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation to talk about the, the course, um, um, you know, both in its previous uh, instantiations and the way that uh, I hope to teach it uh, in, the, uh, in, in the winter. And uh, um, thanks to everyone who uh, decided to sign in today. I see a, a couple of, uh, of, of familiar faces and uh, former student, hi, Jose. Um, and so, it's, yeah, it's great to, great, to, great to be here. So, yeah, to, to answer the question, um, there are two reasons um, that are probably most immediately pertinent to why this uh, topic uh, became the focus of the course, but they start before the course. And one has to do with just my longstanding interest in, in the novel uh, as, a, as a form. And the idea that uh, if novels present themselves to us as something other than entertainment, they do so by virtue of a claim that they enable um, um, the possibility of producing something like a total picture of society, a total picture of the world in which we operate. And the gambit that novelists um, um, always engage in, in some sense, is that by focusing on one character or some small set of characters, they can produce an understanding or something that rivals what it would be to have of an, an understanding of the whole. So there's the so the idea behind a novel would be that everything, you know, including the world of finance, would have to matter in some sense if the novel is going to achieve a kind of totality that rivals the the sense of being able to operate in a world with a with a sense of a whole. The second reason, which is a little bit more immediate, is that there is a precursor for me uh, to this course, a course that I taught a few years ago, which focused on the Gilded Age, which prior to our moment was the moment of the greatest uh, degree of in, um, economic inequality in, uh, in, this, in the history of the United States. And the fact that during that moment, this was the moment where realist novels really came into their own in terms of um, the, the literary history of the United States, that many of the novelists felt that was they were challenged, in some sense, to try to figure out what the you know the phenomenon of, of, of so many millionaires, right? The number of millionaires just right. explodes in the later latter part of the nineteenth century, and the sense that that world of finance was beginning to define reality, but in ways that seemed you know obscure and arcane to uh, those who were charged with producing sort of fictional. Um, uh, versions of the world. And so they felt and began focusing on how do you get the millionaires into, uh, um, um, into the novel, not wanting to cede the authority for reality to the finance sector or to these millionaires, but in some ways trying to figure out how to incorporate them in, in, into a view of the whole. And um, it, it, it struck me that having done that particular course, looking at novels from the late uh, 19th century all the way to say uh, the, great, uh, the Great Gatsby, I think was the novel we concluded with in that course. I thought it might be really fascinating to look at this moment when uh, economic inequality is, is more um, extreme than it was even during the Gilded Age to see what it was or what ways in which those novelists who were concerned with um, that kind of concern, uh, you know, th that kind of inequality uh, what challenges they felt they were facing in producing a novel that could, that could convince us in some sense that it was telling us something about the larger world in which we, which we lived. And the caveat I'll add to that was that what seemed to be different about this particular financial crisis is the way in which the reasons and the causes uh, of this crisis seemed to be obscure and um, occult, even to those who were in the midst of them. That is the, the, the it was not, a, not simply the sense that, you know, millionaires had knowledge that the rest of us don't have, 
but the idea that those within finance didn't fully have a knowledge of what they were doing and that the world was sort of falling apart for reasons that no one could quite uh, comprehend in real time. Well, let me start by saying it's so interesting when you describe, you know, the great Gatsby and the original course, because I think sometimes we forget that we're living history. You know, you look back and you say, oh, look at, you know, that economic moment, look at how that shaped literature and society. And you don't even realize, of course, we're going through this financial crisis and we're going through these epic events. And they're also shaping all of these, you know, extraordinary uh, you know, pieces of society and culture, right? And they're having impacts on trust and, and on relationships. Um, let, let us kind of move into the course itself um, because, you know, you have, I think, very compellingly explained why you believe there would be this influence on literature and how literature really is a medium to be investigating the impact and the way in which, you know, this a uh, financial moment influences all aspects of society. And so I'd love to start seeing how that manifests in literature. And I know one of the books that you have chosen is Capital by John Lanchester. And in it, uh, there is a focus on a street in a London suburb prior to and during the financial crisis. And I'm just curious if you can share how financial capital, as in the book's title, and financial crisis shape this story. and you know, it's, it's an interesting example in my mind of one of the ways in which the crisis clearly had influence on literature that, that you know, the author here is trying to tell. Yes, um, and Lanchester is fascinating as well because he's a novelist who writes directly about, about by, uh, the finance sector and, and economics. And so he's very much concerned to think about what it is to think, you know, to address, um, you know, what finance is doing and what it is that novels doing, the novels are doing. Um, one of the um, um, immediate problems that he um, poses in this, uh, in, this, uh, in, in this novel is exactly how to tell a particular story. And, and the, you know, given um, that in many ways, the, you know, the, the, the history of the classic novel of the 19th century focuses on character and that it is through individual character that, we, that the novel or in, you know, a set of individual characters that the novel tries to achieve its sense, sense of a whole, Part of what he um, um, you know, takes as a point of departure is that if we, if we want to understand finance, we have to understand what's happening to not people themselves directly, but what's happening most immediately to real estate. So right. he, he focuses and he says at the outset that he's going to focus on this particular block and what happens to these houses and what happens to these houses is they go from being, you know, uh, having been sort of nice working class homes to um, million dollar, well, million pound <laughs> um, 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 homes, um, not by virtue of any material change in the homes themselves immediately. Although you do begin to get what we, you know, what we, what was a feature of the financial crisis, a lot of, you know, refurbishing of existing homes, but merely because of what's happening in the finance market. So if you try to look at why does a home uh, triple in value. What, what happens there? The story, you, you can't tell the story in terms of what's actually happening materially to the house, what you're telling the story, what, what you need to do in order to tell the story. It's what's happening to the market, what's happening to a sector in which it, um, it's possible that the same building worth, a, you know, you know, that's worth you know, 40,000 pounds a few decades ago is worth much, you know, much more than that. You can't tell that story by virtue of attending to the physical properties of the house. And to the extent that you can tell it uh, in terms of the people who live in the house, it is not a kind of outpouring of anything about them other than their capacity to pay what it is, um, uh, what, you know, what the going price is, uh, is for that home. So the, so, um, you know, the, the challenge being, how do you get a, you know, the, a sense of the market as real, yeah. the kind of driving, the driving force in producing human action and um, in, in producing and in some respects, determining human action? Well, so it's a good segue because another book that you look at, and I know your books are in the US, the UK and, and beyond, but we're going to stay in the UK for this next book. Uh, it's Rachel Tuss Transit. 
And in that book, there is a character, Faye, who buys a dilapidated house in London and is rehabbing it. And here again, this financial capital theme comes into play. And so I'm curious if you can just share a little bit more about that novel and how the financial crisis appears there as well, because they're, even though these are very different authors, very different books, there are parallels um, in terms of how you know, finance appears um, as a, a really significant strand uh, of, of the book, even as you know, the character development and the emotions are, are really the core of what the reader is focused on. Yeah, well, just a couple of things. One, one is, is um, I mean, uh, Transit is the second of a, a trilogy that Cusk uh, publishes. The first is Outline, Transit's the second one, and Kudos is the third. And I've actually taught Kudos as well in, uh, in, the, context of the, in, in the context of this course. And even before getting into the, um, the refurbishing of the, uh, of the house that's at the center of Transit, it's important also to, say, to um, um, note that for Cusk, the problem of character is also central to, to the novel. She, I, she actually, as, uh, in an essay, says she's no longer even sh sure that you can produce characters with, within the novel. And, and the, there's a way in which the, the, the figure at the center of these novels, Faye, uh, Faye, she's a writer, makes herself manifest only by virtue of the uh, individuals that she comes into contact with who are also who seem, and she has an uncanny ability to really elicit from people stories about themselves. And so she's a kind of unmarked um, center in, um, who you produce not by virtue of seeing what's sort of inside her in some ways. And you know, when you think about character, you know, if, if you, you, know, you say someone has a solid character, you're producing a notion that there's something inside that remains or, um, or maybe gets revealed over time as part of who they are, but what you get from Faye, it's not that you don't get a, you know, a sense of certain, a certain kind of cons consistency, but it only becomes manifest by virtue of interactions with other, um, with other mm -hmm. individuals. And so she's a writer, she's you know, um, um, uh, recently um, um, divorced, sort of restarting her life after coming back. The first book is when she's away from England, uh, from, from London, the second book, Transit, she comes, she comes back with her son and, and at the center of this is uh, buying a home that she's actually told kind of not to buy. It's not, it's not in an up and coming neighborhood, but she likes it for a set of reasons, but she can't simply live in it as it is and begins this process of, of rehabbing, uh, rehabbing the house and you know, creates um, um, a great deal of animosity with her neighbors who have to live through her rehab and despite her various efforts to kind of mollify and create um, a, you know, a, good, a good relationship with these neighbors, she finds herself inevitably at odds. And part of, part of what I think uh, Cusk is doing there with respect to the, the simple way in which Faye trying to live her life through a through, you know, rehabbing of a house produces just a structural conflict between her and her neighbors that can't be solved or resolved by just you know a good neighborliness. And even though we share a kind of animosity towards that uh, the, uh, one of these um, uh, uh, the most um, obstreperous neighbor, we also see a, a way in which her view of Faye is something we can't dismiss as well. Well, so we've talked about two books in which this crisis has played a clear and meaningful role. And I want to take a step back now um, because you obviously read literature widely um, and you've taught classes on this. Um, you know, let's think broadly in what ways do you think the financial crisis has shaped the literature at large since 2008? And, and, you know, how has, in your mind, you know, like literature as a, as a field almost changed because of this, you know, epic event that occurs, you know, around the turn of the decade? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big, big question. I mean, and, and in some sense pertinent because it, it's, you know, the course, you know, um, uh, um, certainly invites that, invites that observation or, you know, that, that consideration. Um, I'll say a couple of things. One preoccupation, and it emerges in, um, um, at least directly in a couple of the books that I uh, um, teach in the course, also in, 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 um, in Lanchester, uh, that 
the crisis raises is in what way do, is art to be valued in terms other than those that are um, shaped by the market? Is art or novels simply a commodity like any other novel? Um, or can one um, attribute to say a serious literary novel, a value that is not in the, at the end of the day determined by you know, the number of readers um, or by some, you know, the, the size of the advance or those kinds of things that um, um, you know, the market, the way, ways in which the market confers that, with, with that which is desirable, which is you, know, you, put a, you, you put something of a price tag on it. And, and so the um, one thing that the financial crisis I think has um, uh, intensified or exacerbated is just where can one find value outside of what seems to be the you know, ever increasing expansion of the market into all uh, domains of uh, domains of human life, and I mean, just to go back to the housing thing for for a moment, um, that Lanchester is, um, um, I think, quite um, you know astute in uh, representing in the uh, in the novel is that the you know the idea of a house. If you have a house, it's it's a use value to you. You have a house, you live in it, you raise your kids, or um, it's a place that you that exists for your inhabiting as such. But one of the ways in which you, the, the financial crisis, um, I wouldn't say change because houses have always been commodity commodities, but um, um, uh, um, you sort of intensified as a way of looking at a house is that you're looking at a house, not only in terms of how you will inhabit it, but also in terms of some anonymous buyer at some point who will buy the house at a price that you will deem at, you know, acceptable. So you are in a house for yourself, but with the idea of the market, you are in a house in terms of the, what you have, what you feel would be before the crisis was the absolute assumption that that house, the value of that home was going to um, increase dramatically. And the, the way in which houses relate to character, again, this is, you know, across the uh, across uh, at least a couple of these novels, would be that you know the you know your credit worthiness at one point is seen as a feature of, of um, you know do you have a job are you a solid character a solid individual, but among the things that we saw during the financial crisis you know the invention of these sort of um, no assets, no no job no assets loans, was that the you know, why could I make a loan? And one, from one angle, that's absolutely crazy. You could, would you make a loan to that individual? But the individual, as long as you give that individual sort of the right to sell that home, right. then what you're betting on is another buyer at some point and, you know, being willing to buy that home for more than the person who doesn't have any assets or job or, or, or a job to back that. So that, um, to, um, but nonetheless, who will, be good, make good on it. So the relationship between something like, you know, the, the, you know, the integrity of the market being like there's some relationship between character and credit worthiness, um, um, you know, say disappears at this, uh, you know, uh, dis disappears at this, uh, uh, at, at this moment. Um, and that becomes a kind of feature of thinking about, well, where then does, where then can you find value? Can you find value um, 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 other than the uh, availability of whatever commodity you are producing as a kind of marketable commodity? And what each of these um, novels, well, the novel by Rachel Cusk, I also did a novel 1004 by Ben Lerner. They raise the question of whether there is a property in the, you know, within art itself that can't be reduced to what someone will pay for it whether they'll give you an advance or they'll give you a fellowship for your novel that actually produces itself as something other to the, uh, to the market. And the sneaking suspicion that it becomes really, really hard to maintain that. Yeah, that is fascinating. And it's, I mean, so interesting to think about how this all shapes literature. I have, I have one final question, and then I'm gonna to turn to the questions in the chat. So if you have questions out there, please start chatting them in. I see we have, a uh, person who was the real estate editor for the Chicago Sun-Times during this moment. And we have another person uh, who was 
uh, basically working with the people that were then featured in the big short. So it looks like we have a virtual room filled with people that may have really insightful and incisive questions. Uh, let me ask you one more, though, before we turn to all of theirs, and it's to look the other way. We've been talking throughout this conversation about essentially how does the financial crisis influence literature? But now literature has come out since the financial crisis, and I imagine it's starting to shape the other way, meaning literature that has come out, you know, in this kind of post financial crisis moment has begun to shape our understanding of finance and capitalism. And I'm curious just how you've seen that phenomenon, meaning, you know, as literature has held up this mirror and kind of presented in, in new ways for us to understand the impact of financing capitalism, how has that shaped our views as a society in your mind on financing capitalism, if at all? Well, that's a really good question. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to disappoint with respect to giving mm -hmm. giving an answer because I, I I do think the you know that the, the the jury is kind of out on whether there has been a sort of cultural lesson learned if we want to think about it in those terms whether the novels have reshaped the way in which um, um, we think about finance. I mean, certainly some of the luster of the finance um, sector, if you look at data that I've, I've seen about the number of graduates who are you know saying they're going to go to be um, you know investment bankers um, um, as well there's some sense that that has changed but um, in it in terms of you know I mean one of the fascinating things about you know this uh, so this relay you know from literature back to the to, to the real world is is you know how um, 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 uh, well, I guess it's in terms of a certain kind of disconnect. Um, I mean, among the things we did, in, uh, you know, in, in the course, and I hope to do it in the in the, in the winter, is to talk about the the, the cinematic version of the the Big Short. Um, um, you know, the film that is really following the, the the finance crisis. And one of the one of the interesting features of this is that when you get to the end, the question of who are the villains and who are the heroes is a really difficult one from the standpoint of finance, right? Because those whom we've been following, following who are on the um, you know, track of trying to understand you know, the fraud um, and the, you know, what is being um, you know, uh, perpetrated by the use of these collateralized debt obligations, the CDOs, which you know, enable these you know, bad mortgages to be in with the AAA mortgages and you have just uh, horrible investment vehicles all along, that at the end of the day, those who benefit are still within right. the market system, right? That, that, they, that the, you know, the, the, the sort of moral world that gets constructed around should these, should these instruments be valued properly is still the world of finance, that there, there is a way in which there's kind of no, no, um, um, no outside of that. And I think that, um, you know, as, I mean, um, as much as the literature has helped us in some sense, um, you know, pay attention to the moral dimension of the moral issues, let's put them that way, or the ethical issues, it hasn't really produced a way for us to think about, you know, um, um, going forward, except to say we can't find the, the values that we're looking for within the market. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it is a really interesting area because it can raise a lot of these questions and doubts, but it is hard to produce solutions because it's so outside of the, of the domain, to your point. Um, I'm going to come now to the questions that are coming into our chat. Uh, Jeffrey Sarles asked, does literature after the financial crisis reflect a greater pessimism about the future, much as it did after World War I? Oh, um... I, you know, again, hard to generalize. I would guess that it um, it does in um, uh, the third novel from uh, uh, Kuska's uh, trilogy, um, Kudos. There's a moment where uh, Faye is talking to um, um, the editor at a publishing house, and um, um, and the the publishing house, in order to to remain solvent, has had to let a lot of mid list literary types go from um and but it's 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 it turns out to be a, a part of a successful 
a financial pro project of saving the press, which includes on the one hand that they start selling uh, books of Sudoku pu puzzles, right? Which sell a lot, but they also wanna keep a certain number of literary authors on their list. And it leads Faye to, to um, um, reflect on what it is that people think they're getting with the literary work. I mean, why are they putting in the work to, right. read, a, uh, to, to read a novel that's being you know, sold as a commodity alongside the, the, the uh, Sudoku puzzles? And she speculates that it may be like even just sort of that there's a value to literary difficulty to being perceived as a kind of the kind of person who is equal to the challenge of sitting down, say, with a Rachel Cusk novel or three of them, and producing a sense of you know, the value of that operation. That turns out also to have a, um, you know, a value that is, you could say, monetizable. So I think the pessimism from, from the literary sector is that um, you know, even the successful effort to, tr to articulate the limitation of uh, the market as a value um, is easily or perhaps too easily you know, subsumed back into the recirculation of, mar of, of market values. So our next question is gonna come from Christopher Dooley and uh, he's actually offered to ask directly. So Christopher, let me turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so my question is uh, a little bit hard to articulate because I myself am still wrapping my head around blockchain and what it is. Uh -huh. um, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how blockchain might alter the exchange of value within literature and or art, um, or if you've come across any authors who are kind of grappling with these with that question. Um, because it strikes me that a lot of the, a lot of the problems that, that you've been exploring so far are in large part because literature is being mediated by very large companies that are centralized, right, and are, are trying to gain the upper hand in markets and, and have sort of, you know, to use Marxist terminology, uh, they they kind of they they have a lock on the means of production and, and on the distributions, um, and and blockchain has the potential to kind of you know reshuffle the chessboard and, and change the way that that goods and services flow and the way that people um, assign value and, and exchange value. Thank you, Christopher. Um, yeah, you're you're uh, pushing you know beyond my uh, uh, knowledge and my capacity to to, to answer. I'll, you know all the but what I'll say is I you know I, I do think with respect to what I mean um, if there is a way to begin to think about alter, uh, alternative values or values alternative to the market, it would be it would actually be committing to a, a notion of the public good. Um, you know, what is the public good? Who ought to finance the public good that stands outside the market? And that's going to take, you know, um, a, a, you know, sort of reorientation of the priorities of govern in government and, um, and you know, a, a, a kind of democratization of, um, um, you know, the, the notion of, um, you know, you know democratization of the economy as such. And I can understand what you know, that blockchain imagines itself to be a mechanism for that, I don't know anything about exactly how that uh, um, how that work works. But the but I think from the standpoint of you know those of us who really value um, literature, it's not necessarily the case that the values um, um, associated with pushing toward the public good will necessarily be things that literature will be leading the way. I mean, you know, so right. the idea would be. A, a society, society organized around the public good might be one in which those of us who want to pursue the writing and reading of serious fiction will be able to do so um, and still not have to worry about, you know, will we have enough to retire and all of that. But I don't know that literature itself will lead the way. It might benefit in certain ways from um, that kind of reorientation, but it won't really tell us how to get there. Our next question is from John Bacardo, and uh, he too has offered to ask directly. Go for it, John. Uh, 
John, you are unmuted, but we don't hear you yet. Okay, we will uh, we'll, we'll wait maybe uh, hearing your voice, but I'm gonna ask another question to Dr. Warren while we do so. Um, one of the, I mean, I think really interesting themes that you're bringing out here is how, you know, these epic moments influence literature and, and how we kind of look at the world. I mean, I have to ask, because we've now gone through another epic moment with the pandemic and the economy really has been in some ways central because it has been such an inequitable impact. Um, if we look at, you know, many dimensions from, you know, what happened to wealth and, and who got wealthy during this pandemic and, and who fell behind, if we look at health and the, you know, very disparate impacts. I'm curious, and I know this is kind of forecasting, but, you know, based on what you have kind of learned both from your last class in the Gilded Age and how that shapes and now this class, how do you think about this moment and you know what are your thoughts about the ways that this is likely to shape literature coming out over the decade ahead well yeah i mean i think it's um well, well i'll put one i'll put it things one way right um you know i do think that the um, um aspects of the crisis that we're in are such that um, even though you know my livelihood is tied up with uh, the ongoing health and uh, relevance of, uh, of literature, right? Um, I do think that that in some sense, given the kinds of crises we're facing is sort of like a really lesser problem, right? That is to say that we're in a moment where, you know, questions of democratic governance, questions of climate change um, are, uh, you know, sort of putting us on the brink of potentially a sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't know. Right, apocalyptic. Apocalyptic <laughs> e, uh, uh, e events. Um, and so whether or not literature will be part of that world, you know, is, is you know, well, first of all, are we going to have a world, right? Are we going to have a world mm -hmm. that will, uh, you know, respect democratic proceduralism? Are we going to have a world in which our coastal cities are not, um, um, you know, uh, un underwater? Right underwater. Yeah, so... Um, um, you know, I mean, literature can certainly amplify and highlight uh, those uh, concerns. But I do think, I mean, what, the other way to think about it would be to say, if we actually value the kinds of things that go along with having a literary and literate culture, which is to say, to be able to spend the time engaging with literature that is, you know, itself demanding something from us, demanding right. part of our lives, demanding part of our time, and that we can do so. And that um, not only because um, um, this is available to a small swath of society, but would be sort of presumably available to anyone who has an interest in that, that there might be a vision of the kind of society that we need in order to maintain literary, um, um, literary values. And so, yeah, so I think that, um, um, literary value would be kind of ancillary to the question of whether or not we have a world that, um, um, you know, that allows for the appropriate reciprocity, um, um, produces, uh, or, or uh, you know, produces enough well-being and, um, you could say, leisure in order yeah. to engage with the um, kinds of problems and questions that literature puts before us. John, I believe you are now able to ask your question. Uh, please go for it if you can. All right, uh, John, unfortunately, oh, let's see. Um, I, I, I've asked you to unmute now, John. We'll try it one more time. Um, there we go, we hear you, yeah. go for it. So, so it wasn't my fault this last time. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I get a little bit baffled. I'm interested in the general cultural expression of what, how, how culture expresses what goes on in finance. But what baffles me is how we immediately go binary. Um, and we, we speak of uh, trying to get some sort of notions that come from outside, um, say finance or, or market thinking and so on. And when I look at 2008, I see a failure of market by way of all the different um, um, influences. So when you subset, when you do away with risk with Fannie and Freddie Mac, 
and and um, and those things. So I don't see market failure. I see already uh, um, people giving up on 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 what the market would ordinarily do, and subsidizing risk and and and, and really subsidizing bubbles. Um, yeah, thank you, John. And, it's, oh, oh. and it's because of good intentions and good policies that you have, say, Fannie and Freddie. But that's precisely why you do away with any notion, real notion of risk, and, and why you end up with the with the you know wholesale failure of the system. Thank you. And I guess you know that's a question that's kind of asking on the you know how we understand the crisis itself. Um, you know, beyond how it impacts literature, Dr. Warren. Yeah, well, that, I, it's, it's a good, I mean, the, the point about binarization, I think, is well taken. One doesn't want to, uh, want to you know, produce a kind of binary. Um, and yet, I, I mean, the, the sense that I got with respect to your answer was that you raised the problem of binarization and then you reproduced it, right? That is to say that it is not, it's, it's simply to understand that the market, you know, the full investment in um, market values in which you don't, in which you, you know, guard against moral hazard by uh, uh, allowing the greatest amount of risk. And so that, that is what you describe as um, uh, a sort of bulwark against the idea of the, of the bubble. You know, I, I, I'm reminded, you know, going back to the 19th century of, you know, a novel like Dickens's um, Little Dorrit, um, which at, at the middle of it, uh, with the character of Mr. Myrtle, he's this, you know, um, perfectly kind of bland, but a bland villain. He's the heart of finance and the heart of a huge bubble that um, undermines the fortunes of a great many people, right? And so the, the, the history of capitalism, the history of finance is the history of bubbles prior to, Fed, uh, you know, Freddie and, you know, Mac and, you know, Fannie Mae. So I don't think you can actually, um, you know, again, taking away the, uh, I mean, again, crediting your point about, you know, we don't want to, to produce a, a binary as such, but I don't think that, um, um, you know, you know as, as I see it, and this, I know this is an ongoing debate about the, you know, the real cause of the uh, 2008, uh, 2008 crisis and people fall on different sides of that. But yes, I, I, again, good point about the non-binary, but not, you know, uh, about, you know, not binarizing but I don't think you're, I, th I felt that your answer was actually reproducing a kind of binary. Uh, Dylan, you have our final question for Dr. Warren. Great, hi, how are you? Um, I'm kind of wondering, you mentioned kind of the idea of the kind of the crises of the financial crisis, and you also touched on climate change. So I'm kind of wondering how you think these ongoing crises kind of we're living in a, in a age of collective anxiety with obviously COVID and climate change and lots of other things how it's kind of affected the psyche of, of writers and literature as a whole, and how you think it'll impact kind of the next generation of, of writers as well. Yeah, again, um, you know, big question, a good one, um, hard, hard to speculate on. Um, going back to the novels that I'm, I, you know, uh, will be teaching, um, one of the things I noticed about uh, Lanchester's Capital is um, the emergence of a, you could say, similarly situated um, group of people um, who aren't simply aware of themselves as a kind of class because they're too kind of dispersed in the novel. And these were individuals who were college educated, um, but operating in somewhat subordinate subaltern positions. So the, the major crisis in capital initially is caused by um, the assistant who's working for the big banker who doesn't really know what's going on. Um, there is um, the assistant to the artist um, who produces part of a problem. You have um, a, um, a, 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 an immigrant um, who is a well-educated um, African immigrant in the, in the UK, but who is working as a, a parking um, um, I forget the exact title of that position. There's a, there is a specific title, but it's escaping me. But the point being that you have a lot of individuals, college educated, who are who constitute kind of the group who would be sort of you know for, you know the next group of writers, the next uh, group of of uh, you know professional readers, finding themselves without any real prospect of of um, of uh, uh, you know, 
finding a situation that is kind of commensurate with, you know, if you, you know, stay with the, um, you know, with the human capital to stay within economic terms that they have, that they have accrued, you get a certain kind of, I think, pessimism about it. You know, what is it going to mean, you know, that I have uh, um, done everything right, positioned myself, and now I have a, now I face a world in which I can't find the means for reproducing the world. And so I do think there's a certain kind of pessimism, uh, pessimism there. But you know, you could say there's a way in which continuing to write is an act of optimism. And so uh, what we could say, as long as people are continuing to continuing to write, however pessimistic they are, their act, the act of doing that suggests that they've got a sense of the possibility that there will be readers, that there will be a way of sort of producing, uh, you know, continuing to produce uh, something like shared value. Well, that feels like a perfect and optimistic way to end our conversation with you, which has been a wonderful one. Um, thank you for sharing your course, but also really giving us an opportunity to see into literature more broadly and to apply a lot of the ideas from your course to you know, the current moment and even uh, what the future may look like. And thank you all for being here with us and being in this conversation with Dr. Warren. Um, we will be sending out the video and also the links that were asked for during the chat so that you all can look up those books as well as see the course that he'll be leading this winter. Um, I hope everyone has a good rest of your day. And again, uh, Dr. Warren, thank you so much for your time and your inquiry with us this afternoon. Yeah, thanks, Seth. And thanks to everybody who asked, uh, asked questions.